As I say, everybody here has the ability absolutely to do anything I do and, and much beyond. Can other people tap dance to work? What's the secret of that? You find your passion. You find your passion. I was very, very lucky to find it, you know, when I was uh, seven or eight years old. And, you know, and, and fortunately, my children have found their passion. My, you know, one son loves farming like nothing else. One son loves music like everything else. And, and all three of them love philanthropy and what they get to do. You're lucky in life when you, you find it. And uh, you can't guarantee you're going to find it in your first job out. But I always tell the college students that come out, I say, take the job that you would take if you were independently wealthy. You know, that's, you're going to do well at it. If you think you're going to be a lot happier if you've got 2X instead of X, you're probably making a mistake. I mean, it, uh, it, uh, you, ought to, you, ought to, you ought to find something you like that's, that works with that. And if, and you'll get in trouble if, if you think that making 10x or 20x is the answer to everything in life because then you will do things like borrow money when you shouldn't or, or maybe cut corners on, on things that your employer wants you to cut corners on. Or, it just doesn't make any sense. You won't like it when you look back on it. Famous lesson about a margin of safety that you don't drive a truck that weighs 9,900 pounds across a bridge that says limit 10,000 pounds because you can't be that sure about it. If you see something like that, you go down a little further down the road and you find one that says limit 20,000 pounds and that's the one you drive across. Mm -hmm. Capitalism, uh, when you have a wonderful business, it's like having an economic castle. And the nature of capitalism is that people want to come in and take your castle. It's perfectly understandable. I mean, if I'm selling television sets or something, there's going to be 10 other people who are going to try and sell a better television set. If I have a restaurant here in Omaha, people are going to try and copy my menu and give more parking and take my chef and so on. So capitalism's all about somebody coming and trying to take the castle. Now, what you need is you need a castle that has some durable competitive advantage, some castle that has a moat around it. And that moat, best, one of the best moats in many respects is to be a low cost producer. But sometimes the moat is just having more talent. I mean, if you're the heavyweight champion of the world and you keep knocking out people, you've got a competitive advantage as long as you can keep doing it. And it's very profitable. Only should expect to make money in things that I understand. And when I say understand, I don't mean understand, you know, what the product does or anything like that. I mean, understand what the economics of the business are likely to look at, look like 10 years from now or 20 years from now. I know, in general, what the economics of, say, Wrigley chewing gum will look like 10 years from now. The internet isn't going to change the way people chew gum. It isn't going to change which gum they chew. You know, if you own the chewing gum market in a big way, and you've got double mint and spearmint and juicy fruit, those brands will be there 10 years from now. So I can't pinpoint exactly what the numbers are going to look like on Wrigley, but I'm not going to be way off if I try to look forward on something like that. That Evaluating that company is within what I call my circle of competence. I understand what they do. I understand the economics of it. I understand the competitive aspects of the business. Figuring out the economic consequences, understanding the economic characteristics of a business is different than predicting the fact that an industry is going to do wonderfully. So when I look at the internet, I say this is a marvelous thing and I love to play around on the computer and it, I order my books from Amazon and all kinds of things, but I don't know who's going to win. And unless I know who's going to win, I'm not interested in investing. I'll just play around on the computer. And, uh, uh, Defining your circle of competence is the most important aspect of investing. It's not how important, uh, how, how large your circle is. You don't have to be an expert on everything. But knowing where the perimeter of that circle of what you know and what you don't know is, and staying inside of it, is all important. Tom Watson Sr., who started IBM, said in his book, he said, I'm no genius, he said, but I'm smart in spots and I stay around those spots. And, you know, that is the key. Uh, so if I understand a few things and I stick in that arena, you know, I always look at IQ and, and talent as sort of representing the, uh, the horsepower of the motor. But then in terms of the output, the efficiency with which the motor works, that depends on rationality because a lot of people start out with 400 horsepower motors and get 100 horsepower of output. And it's way better to have a 200 horsepower motor and get it all into output. And, and so why do, why do smart people do things that interfere with really getting the, the, the output they're entitled to? And it's, uh, 
it, it gets into it, the habits and the character and the temperament, and it really gets into behaving in a rational manner. It's and not letting, not getting in your own way. As I say, everybody here has the ability, uh, absolutely, to do anything I do and, and much beyond. And and some of you will, and, and some of you won't. But it it, it it will. The ones that won't, it will because be because. Uh, uh, you get in your own way. It won't because the the world doesn't allow you to. It'll, it will be because you don't uh, allow yourself to. So I want a simple business, easy to understand, great economics now, honest and able management, and and uh, then I can see about in a general way where they're going to be ten years from now. And if I can't see where they're going to be ten years from now, I don't want to buy it. You know, I buy an apartment house, don't get a quote on it for five years. I'm happy if the apartment house produces the returns that I expect. But people buy a stock and they look at the price the next morning and they decide whether they're doing well or not doing well. It's, it's crazy because they're buying a piece of a business. That's what Graham, the most fundamental part of, of what he taught me. You know, you're not buying a stock. You're buying a, you're buying a part ownership in a business. You will do well if the business does well and if you didn't pay a totally silly price. And that's what it's all about. And you ought to buy businesses you understand. But buying Berkshire Hathaway itself was a mistake because Berkshire was a lousy textile business. And I bought it very cheap. I'd been taught by Ben Graham to buy things on a quantitative basis. Look around for things that are cheap. And that I was taught that, say, in 1949 or 50. It made a big impression on me. So I went around looking for what I call used cigar butts of stocks. And the cigar butt approach to buying stocks is that you walk down the street and you're looking around for cigar butts and you find this, honestly, this terrible looking, soggy, ugly looking cigar one puff left in it but you pick it up and you get your one puff disgusting you throw it away but it's free i mean it's cheap and then you look around for another soggy you know one puff cigarette well that's what i did for years it's a mistake uh although you can make money doing it but you can't make it with big money it's so much easier just to, to buy wonderful businesses so now i would rather buy a wonderful business at a fair price than a fair business at a wonderful price but in those days i was buying cheap stocks and berkshire was selling below its working capital per share. You got the plants for nothing, you got the machinery for nothing, you got the inventory and receivables at a discount. It was cheap, so I bought it. And 20 years later, I was still running a lousy business, and that money did not compound. You really want to be in a wonderful business, because the time is the friend of the wonderful business. You keep compounding, it keeps doing more business, and you keep making more money. Time is the enemy of the lousy business. I could have sold Berkshire, perhaps liquidated it, and made a quick little profit, you know, one puff. But staying with those kind of businesses is, 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 is a big mistake. So you might say I learned something out of that mistake, and I would have been way better off taking what I did with Berkshire is I kept buying better businesses. I started the insurance business, the seized candy, the buffalo, and all, all kinds of things. I would have been way better doing that with a with a brand new little entity that I'd set up rather than using Berkshire as the platform. Now I've had a lot of fun out of it. I mean, everything in life seems to turn out for the better, so I, I, I don't have any complaints about that.